So hello and welcome to another episode of Top 10s. I am your interim host, Carl Smallwood, and today we're talking about 10 of the most audacious Ponzi schemes in history. And this video was written by Name Withheld Upon Request, so just pretend it was written by Hatsune Miku if you're really that bothered about it. Let's get to it. For anyone unfamiliar with the term, or at least its specific definition, a Ponzi scheme is where you create a fake business or something, and then promise the absolute world to anyone and everyone you can bend the ear of and convince them to invest. Then, and here's the part that makes this scam so successful and kind of beautiful in its simplicity, use a portion of those invested funds to pay back some of the people who initially invested rather than just taking all the money and running. The idea being that by actually delivering on whatever ridiculous promise you made initially will result in even more people investing hoping to see a similar return. You then rinse and repeat these steps until you have a big enough pile and then just take it all. A literal confidence scam. Named for Italian businessman Charles Ponzi, a hallmark of this classic swindle and the thing that makes it popular even to this day, <coughs> NFTs, is that until the scam part happens, it is technically possible for the average Joe to make some money, although it's not very likely. So we're not advising anybody out there throw their money into one of these things, of course, but it's important to know why this particular grift is so prevalent, despite being so well known, the name for it is common parlance. Without the way, here are 10 stories of the most audacious Ponzi schemes from history. And as always, remember the adage, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. Number 10, Greater Ministries International. Give and it shall be given unto you. Luke 6.38. This was the clarion call of the Greater Ministries International. A church, it says that in quotation marks, founded by some weirdo called Gerald Payne. Payne was a swindler, a conned man, and a lover of animals. That last part isn't us trying to soften his image in any way, by the way. It's just that he was once caught travelling through an airport with a bunch of bestiality porn, and that detail will now be burned forever into our minds, so now you have to think about it too. Moving on, Payne's scam was almost cartoonishly simple, and he quite literally promised he would double any investor's money, telling them he was investing in things like precious metals or the buying of foreign debt. However, Payne was a able to avoid setting off too many bull alarms by making the target of his scams people who are already a few sandwiches short of a picnic. The extreme religious right, white supremacists, and members of the sovereign citizen movement. You know, losers. This isn't to say that ordinary folks weren't swindled too, but as the scam grew in scale, pain very deliberately focused in his efforts on rabid anti-government types, which we have to admit is pretty genius because who are they going to complain to when they get ripped off? the government. Speaking of the government, they found it rather difficult, shall we say, to actually stop paying his associates even when they knew exactly what he was doing because he technically was a church, allowing him to use various loopholes to avoid things like tax or having to declare income. All in all, Payne was able to swindle people out of almost half a billion dollars before being convicted of big fraud in 1999. Number 9. The Julian Peat Oil Scam Arguably the most important facet of any successful scam or swindle is just plain old swag and confidence. Con man is a shortening of confidence man after all. And Courtney Shortsey had confidence and then some. As for the scam itself, Shortsey was able to buy a lease on an oil field in Santa Fe in the 1920s and rather than, you know, drill for some oil, he invested what little money he had left into weirdly antagonistic ads in local newspapers promising big returns. For example, one ad saw Shortsey explicitly tell widows and orphans not to invest in his oil drilling company, which remember had no oil drills because it was an investment for people with some walking around money. Weirdly, this worked. Positioning himself and his company, the Julian Petroleum Corporation, which would be shortened to the Julian Peak Corporation to make it sound folksy and wholesome, as independent with the average American as its ideal investor, Shortsey secured millions in investments with some people literally walking into his office to hand him their hard-earned wages, them evidently not trusting the postman or the bank for a check or something. And you know what? Some of them made money. Money because Julian Pete did manage to strike oil. A few times, in fact. However, rather than being happy with a decent return on his investment, Shortsey used his success to suck it in more people, selling more shares than he was legally able to and throwing the taxman off his scent by sending all of his accounting work to Delaware which was apparently just the Wild West in the 20s, I guess, for the tax man. The, the whole thing eventually crumbled when Shortsey pissed off one too many people with the ability to actually do something about what he was doing. Read the IRS. And weirdly, Charlie Chaplin, who is said to have gotten into a fist fight with the con man in a restaurant at one point. We don't know why, but it happened, so we're mentioning it. Someone also literally took a shot at Shortsey with a gun, though in fairness, he did once tell investors that if he was lying to them, they had his permission to shoot him. So he kind of had that one coming. Number eight, Towers Financial Corporation. 
Debt collection is a nasty, sleazy business that tends to attract the absolute worst kind of corporate, money-obsessed sociopath. It's also potentially incredibly lucrative, provided you have a screaming more of darkness where your soul should be. And for many years, this is how Towers Financial made its money, buying debt for literal pennies on the dollar, and then sending people to harass the debtor into paying. As if this wasn't evil enough, one of the primary targets of the company was people in medical debt. So, you know, people recovering from cancer and the like. And believe it or not, this story is about to get worse. Not content with hounding cancer patients for money they did not have, the company held by current skeleton, Steve Hoffenberg, began cooking the books and luring investors in with grossly exaggerated financial statements, selling their legitimacy by pointing to their newly hired, handsomely paid consultant, Jeffrey Epstein. Yes, that's Jeffrey Epstein. So long before he was diddling kids, he was fiddling the books. Also, unsurprisingly, in later years before he became a skeleton, Hoffenberg would try to pin the whole thing on Epstein because, let's be real, it's far from the worst thing that guy did. When the scam was finally uncovered, hundreds of millions of dollars from over 200,000 investors had been stolen and pissed away. Number seven, Lou Pearlman. Lou Pearlman, or Big Popper, as he liked to style himself, no, really, this guy called himself Big Popper, rose to prominence in the 90s by being the guy who helped form and manage both the Backstreet Boys and NSYNC, as well as, for a time, a before-she-was-famous Britney Spears as a member of the girl group Innocence, spelled like this. The 90s, everybody. Now, while this video is about Ponzi schemes, we kind of have to mention the other weird stuff Perlman did, because we can't stop thinking about it. For example, Perlman was obsessed with blimps, so much so that he bought multiple blimps throughout his life, almost all of which immediately crashed. Despite this, Perlman was able to secure multiple million dollar investments in several blimp oriented companies he founded, even though his blimps kept crashing or detonating in midair moments after takeoff. And a detail here I could not believe is that he got investment in his first blimp company before he had a blimp. He had no blimps. He had a blimp company and no blimps, and he got investment bought a blimp that crashed four seconds after takeoff. So, and in later years, that has been rumored to be like, you know, a tax write-off or a deliberate act of fraud. And then he made another blimp company that people also invested in. What? Anyway, onto the scam. Using the clout he attained by managing Mr. Sexy back himself, Perlman convinced people to invest in non-existent companies with impressive sounding names like Transcontinental Airlines Incorporated. Yes, the guy who crashed, to quote almost every one of his blimps, somehow convinced people to invest millions into an airline that did not exist. You really can't make this stuff up, folks. Eventually, the swindle was revealed. Perlman fled to Indonesia, where he likely would have remained if not for the fact he continued to live the high life, which attracted the notice of a tourist who recognized him from the news, reporting to the authorities who then deported his blimp loving ass back to the US. He died in custody in 2016. Number six, Moneytron. So right away, from the name alone, you know this one is a scam, right? But somehow, the guy behind Moneytron, supposedly a supercomputer using a proprietary algorithm that could predict the movements of the stock market with unary accuracy, in effect offering potentially limitless returns, was a bigger pause for thought than the sh** name. Moneytron, remember? Okay, so Jean-Pierre Van Rossum did have a degree in economics, and he had worked very briefly with a Nobel Prize winning economist, but he was also just a really weird dude, to the point he makes, you know, the aforementioned Lou Pearlman and his blimp obsession look positively normal. For example, Van Rossum, among other things, wrote a bizarrely detailed guide to Belgian brothels, all seemingly reviewed by himself. All 1,000 of them. He also, according to some sources, kept his wife's corpse after she committed suicide in a fridge for a little bit until a power cut made him get rid of it. And people gave this guy money, and you'd think this would put off all but the most desperate or easily swayed investors, but hell, just the whole potentially unlimited returns thing is such an obvious and massive red flag, it wouldn't be out of place in Tiananmen Square. But no, Rossum was able to get a lot of people who should have known better, or at least could afford to hire people who did, to invest in, again, Moneytron. A computer that could make unlimited money, including apparently the Belgian royal family. When investors inevitably asked to see Moneytron, who wouldn't want to see the Moneytron, Rosen would tell them that he was totally in his office behind a mysterious door nobody but him could open. Amazingly, this excuse worked on people for years. And for anyone wondering, well, how did this go on as long as it did, if this thing did not exist? Remember, this is a Ponzi scheme, which meant that Rossum would pay back early investors. 
and he was able to do so because the company had no outgoings besides what he creamed off the top and used for his own extravagances, like buying himself a hundred Ferraris. Number five, the Swedish Match King. Now there are some who would likely contest the inclusion of Ivar Kruger on this list because while he did swindle many people out of many millions of dollars, he was also a very successful businessman, which is kind of how he did that first thing. You see, Kruger was well known for selling matches. A lot of them. Well, actually almost literally all of them, with some estimates saying at the peak of his influence, Kruger's company, Swedish Match, a conglomerate of various match factories Kruger bought after acquiring his own father's match factory in the early 20th century, whew, making anywhere upwards of 75% of all matches used worldwide, a fact that likely makes it unsurprising that many took to calling Kruger the Match King. This almost total, literally global monopoly understandably earned Kruger a lot of money and influence. Influence he'd used to bend the ear of many an important person, and money he'd used to purchase a multitude of legitimate businesses. And these businesses would ultimately become the cornerstone of Kruger's con. You see, Kruger would take the money earned by his legitimate businesses and just sort of move it around, shuffling the financials of companies that weren't doing very well to make it look as if they were, and leveraging his position as king of matches to convince people to invest in them. A detail of Kruger's con that sort of brilliant in a messed up kind of way is that he would loan massive amounts of money to struggling countries in the third world in return for exclusive rights to sell matches within them. Once indebted to him, he'd then begin buying up various businesses to bolster his portfolio, thus giving him even more ways to hide his financial shenanigans. And as with all the stories on this list, Kruger was eventually rumbled after being found out he committed suicide, leaving behind a troubled legacy and directly inspiring the creation of the US Securities Act. Because you, you can't do that anymore. Although people have tried, as we're about to discuss. Number four, Reed Slatkin Investment Club. As we've noted a few times in this video, the key to a successful con is inspiring some degree of trust in people. One did this by posing as a man of God, one by touting their connection to Mr. Sexyback, and one, you know, the one we just mentioned, by noting that they had the ear of world leaders. So what did Reed Slatkin do to engender a similar level of trust? Well, he was a minister, which is so far so good, we guess, in the Church of Scientology. Then again, we guess that would encourage more cynical people to invest, because Scientologists are really good at taking people's money. Moving swiftly on, Slatkin promised investors an obviously bullshit return of about 25% on any money invested into his club, using his connection to an internet startup called Earthlink and the commitment to the tenants of Xenu, our great galactic tormentor, to convince them he was on the level. That's not a joke, by the way. Many of Slatkin's victims were Scientologists, and some of them were even famous. Like, for example, Greta Van Susteren, a bull merchant working for Newsmax. Slatkin then began pissing the money away on everything from fast cars to, get this, a theme park, the latter being something he apparently wanted people to invest in then just never built. He just took the money and went to another theme park, I guess. Slatkin was found out in the early 2000s and sentenced to 14 years in prison. He died in 2015. Number three, the Mavrodi Mondial money box. Remember earlier in the video when I said if something's too good to be true, it probably is, and how we've talked about how the wildly unrealistic projections of like 25% of a return on investment should be an immediate and obvious red flag that something is a con? Well, Sergei Mavrodi was promising people a 3,000% return on their investment and they fell for it. The crux of Mavrodi's plan was an aggressive marketing campaign aimed squarely at working class Russians that promised the aforementioned massive unrealistic returns, luring them in with images of elated Russian investors being able to swap the shares in MMM, his company, for a whole house. Exactly what, if anything, MMM did is never really established, which didn't matter because remember, this was a Ponzi scheme. Some people did walk away as millionaires, which was great for them, not so much for the people that were inspired to invest because of their good fortune, and while they got out while the going was good, many, many others, quite literally millions, were not so fortunate. And just as an idea of how much money this guy stole, when the Russian equivalent of the IRS turned up to you know, take away his ill-gotten gains, they needed 17 trucks. 17 trucks of cash. And what makes the story of Sergei Mavrodi so baffling is the sheer goal with which he conducted himself. For example, after being arrested for fraud and evading taxes, he ran for office hoping that he could use his position to retroactively pardon himself for his crimes. Th this obviously didn't work and he went on the run, whilst of course setting up numerous pyramid and Ponzi schemes, because old habits die hard. Mavrodi was eventually arrested but only served four years in prison before instantly going back to ripping people off, aiming his sights at the third world, duping African investors with a new company he also called MMM because 
Why not at this point? And a business pitch that reads like the literal textbook definition of what a pyramid scheme is, telling investors that their money would come from the fees paid by new investors they convinced to join. Mavrodi eventually got his though, dying of a heart attack in 2018. A con man to the end, his funeral was reportedly paid for by investors in his African Bitcoin startup, because of course this guy was also into crypto. Number two, Scott Rothstein. For the most part, Ponzi schemes are really about one thing, making fat stacks. But for some, while the money is a nice bonus, it's secondary to what the money lets them buy and what it represents, power, influence, the respect of their peers. This is what seems to have driven Florida-based lawyer Scott Rothstein to defraud people out of over a billion dollars. We mean, he also bought lots of stuff, including a fleet of cars kept in their own air-conditioned garage and a gold-plated toilet for himself and then a second one for his wife. His and hers gold-plated toilets, what a romantic. But what he seemed to have gotten off on though was the prestige his ill-gotten gains allowed him to just buy, essentially, like, you know, they, they added to his profile. Rothstein used the money he made from selling investments in lawsuits, which as an aside, is the most American thing I've ever heard. And the Cliff Notes version of what he did is essentially just go to investors and say, hey, I'm part of a big class action, would you like to buy in? Um, you'll get your money back when you know the lawsuit pays off. And that's apparently a thing you can do in America. Who knew? Anyway, he would use the money, you know, defrauding people using this method to fund politicians, sponsor local events in Florida, and donate extensively to charity. All these things raised his profile considerably, allowing him to hop with the fanciest of knobs and mingle with celebrities like Arnold Schwarzenegger, Chris Tucker, and Kevin Spacey, which is probably going to date you know, whenabouts he did this. But here's a not so fun fact for you all. If you donate illegally obtained money to a charity and the IRS finds out, the charity sort of has to just give that money back, which is what happened when Rothstein was found out with the Fort Lauderdale Holy Cross Hospital, who had to return a million dollar donation Rothstein had made to fuel his own ego. Something that may make you happy to learn then, that since 2010, Rothstein has been serving out a 50 year sentence for among other things, fraud, because of course. Finally, number one, Tom Petters. I'd like to read you a quote now, folks. Minnesotans need to be reminded there are thousands of entrepreneurs in our state who are grounded in community values, give generously to charity, act as true mentors to other business people, are ethical stewards of investors, and grow good jobs. They are not Tom Petters. And that right there is a quote from the judge who sentenced Tom Petters to 50 years in federal prison for defrauding people out of literally billions upon billions of dollars. So how did he do it? Well, to put it simply, by lying his ass off for over a decade and seemingly never stopping to think what was going to happen when the IRS realized something was amiss. And as an aside, it's probably worth noting that even in the entries where we didn't specifically mention it, in almost every one of the stories we've covered so far, the reason why the person got caught is due to the IRS or their country's equivalent crawling up their ass with a microscope they noticed irregularities in their finances. Something that is wont to happen when you do what Petters did and sell things that did not exist. Specifically, Petters would, through his company, Petters Group Worldwide, invent fictitious orders for millions of dollars worth of electronics he'd claim were to be sold to big box stores like Costco or Walmart. Petters would then use these non-existent orders as collateral on loans. Now here comes the devious part. Petters would then use the money from these loans to pay off other loans. He'd got on using the same tactic and then ask for an even bigger loan to buy more stuff. He'd then use the money from that loan to pay off the other loan and ask for another one and so on and so forth. Eventually, Petters was casually asking for and receiving literal billion dollar loans from banks using this method. Now with the gift of hindsight, it's pretty obvious this was a scam, but how the hell were the banks supposed to know? Petters always had official looking paperwork. For anyone curious about where it came from, he'd get another company in on it to create it for him that they'd write off on their taxes. They also got indicted, it's a story for another day. But this paperwork looked official and showed that he was buying and selling millions, if not billions of dollars worth of electronics and he always paid back his loans plus interest on time sometimes even early and always happy to pay the fees for doing so on paper he was a slam dunk investment which is kind of the problem all of this stuff only existed on paper and eventually someone took a look at that paper and was all like what this isn't right petters was arrested in 2008 and is currently serving a 50 year sentence for fraud Good. So I hope you found this video to be entertaining, informative, and educational. If you are inclined to agree, leave a like on it, comment below with feedback or suggestions, or subscribe for more content like this. And as I always like to say to everybody watching at home, go out there and have the day that you deserve. Cheers. So I'm coming down with something right now, and I've got a real, real sore throat. So I needed my special magic juice.
Oh, it's a cribber joke from Sean Locke. Don't worry, it's uh, it's water. But it's water from a canal. Did you know our canals have poo in them? That's a, that's a thing. British canals have poo in them. It's kind of a big deal. There was no drinking water in my place for a while because of that. Because the, the water had poo in it. Cheers!